We've all heard of Choco Stars, the cookies with the soft center and those nice big chocolate chips. They pull out all the stops to catch our attention. But has anyone ever taken a good look at them? Who are they? Where do they come from? What do we know about their ingredients? Wheat, cocoa and sugar have been a part of our diet for centuries, but they're now causing huge damage to both society and the environment. Things have gotten so bad for most small producers, especially those in developing countries, that the barcodes on our products are like the bars of a jail. But how did it get like this? To explain, here's a little story about a sack of flour. Until the Middle Ages, this sack was generally sold locally, on the village square or at an early wholesale market. In the 16th century, colonization led to the arrival of new products. There was coffee, sugar and cotton produced on the other side of the world on large plantations whose owners controlled the prices and the quantities, all on the back of slave labour. Let's fast forward a little. The Industrial Revolution boosted the need for supplies to the cities, which were expanding at the expense of the countryside. Communications were improving, people could travel faster, and so could agricultural commodities, all in the prevailing climate of free enterprise. Merchants grew in influence and controlled trade between producers and consumers. As a symbol of these modern times, our sack of flour and its tropical friends such as cocoa were now listed side by side at the Chicago Board of Trade. After World War II, major brands became a part of daily life. This was the golden age of mass consumerism and supermarkets sprang up to meet demand. The customer is king, well that was the legend anyway. Governments introduced systems of market regulation to keep the prices of raw materials higher than the cost of production. The state counted every bean. Things began to speed up in the early 80s. New producer countries joined in. Major players by now, supermarkets teamed up to form international networks, while states signed up to trade liberalization. Our sacks of flour, cocoa and sugar were traded on global markets. Products from family farms, were now in direct competition with ones from large industrialized plantations. Profits went through the roof, The small producers hardly saw a cent. Within a few centuries, we've gone from markets based on local farmers' production capacity to globalized markets determined by the whims of a few buyers. So, what's the situation today? It's very simple. On one side, there are two and a half billion producers. On the other, seven billion consumers. And in the middle, a few intermediaries who run the show and take advantage of the constant stream of raw materials modern society depends on. First, there are the traders, long established players who handle 90% of world grain production, for example. Then there are the brands. Glance in your cupboard and you'd think there were lots of them. But in fact, most are owned by a handful of large food processing companies. And finally, the retailers continue to expand their networks even into developing countries, while their numbers decline. For example, behind half of the roughly 100,000 hyper and supermarkets in Europe, there are only 10 retailers. In recent years, acquisitions and mergers have increased concentration in these three areas of the supply chain. The winners now have enough power to impose pretty dubious practices on their commercial partners. Firstly, in the name of consumers, pressure on price, cascades down to producers. Retailers and major brands also tend to jettison producers who won't accept their conditions. And at the same time, they impose stricter standards that only the largest producers can comply with. Under such unfair rules as these, agricultural markets look more like a battlefield than a farmer's field. Heavily mechanized large farms, which often rely on casual labor, are the only ones who can make ends meet. However, Ever-increasing numbers of small producers, most of whom have family farms and work by hand, are abandoning their farms. They flock to cities, unless, that is, they take jobs on the same large plantations that cause their downfall. Small cocoa and sugar producers, for instance, are more and more dependent on their customers. With falling incomes and fluctuating prices, their standard of living is falling in many areas due to pressure from buyers. They cannot plan for the future and forced child labor remains widespread. Obviously, he who sows does not reap the rewards. However, these social impacts are not the only price to be paid. To boost their yields, large farms and small producers are tempted to use more pesticides and fertilizers. Animals, plants 
and people's health all suffer from this chemical arms race. Large plantations often plant intensive monocultures that guzzle water, exhaust the soils, and pump out CO2. The climate is getting out of kilter, and resources are growing scarce. Whatever retailers and brands' cheerful assurances, the costs are spiralling out of control. So, what should we do? Give up Choco Stars? Not necessarily. As it happens, cocoa, sugar, and the other ingredients in our cookies could generate enough money to ensure that no one goes hungry. Right now, we could agree to pay producers a few cents more, as long as that extra money goes to the producer, of course. In particular, we could demand a greater trade regulation, so the producers who supply us with our treats can break free. To find out more about how to get involved, follow the campaign, Who's Got the Power?